Tadam. Good afternoon. Sharing this time. It works. That's a, that's a feature. <laughs> <laughs> it's a better start. So I think maybe we can get started, or do we wait a bit? Uh, what do you think? Yeah, maybe a minute or two more here, and then may as well. OK, perfect. I'm not sure if our moderator has, has thought. 
Still seeing a few more people filter in, but we are up to 50 folks. So I don't know, that seemed like a reasonable time to get started. Okay, perfect. Uh, well, uh, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we'd like to talk a bit about GraphQL, uh, what it is, why we think it's useful, and share our experience working with it. So first off, uh, what's GraphQL? Uh, so GraphQL is a strongly typed query language originally developed by Facebook that serves as an alternative to REST and currently has implementations in many languages. Um, but how do you get started with GraphQL or what does it even look like? Well, uh, when creating a new GraphQL service, we should start by designing its mandatory schema, which looks something like this. Uh, in this schema, uh, we'll define the requests or API consumers can make and a response to them. This has the advantage of providing us with schema validation. So malform requests are rejected quickly since the schema validation is performed as the first processing step when a request is received. Uh, we'll now review some of the basic components of a GraphQL schema. Uh, a GraphQL schema contains object types with fields that consumers can select. Uh, and the GraphQL specification supports by default the scalar types string, in float, boolean, and id that we can see here. Um, but developers can also define their own scalars, which will be mapped to something else inside the application. So for example, this daytime scalar we have here could be mapped to a Java daytime, to a string, to whatever we need inside our application. Uh, the aim of having this is just to make things a bit clearer. Uh, so what's this type? And you can add like a definition of the type, like what is it supposed to be? So not everything is just like strings and then you kind of have to figure it out. Um, object types can also contain other object types. Uh, I'm note from here uh, that arrays are supported out of the box. So for example, we have now added a new field that is reviews. And this field is actually an array of other object type, which is called review and that it contains a score and an opinion. Um, another cool thing GraphQL provides is that fields can accept arguments like score here. Uh, and these arguments can be marked as mandatory in the schema by adding an exclamation mark next to them. So if that field is missing, the schema validation will reject the request. This means that we can only provide the reviews field if you also provide the score that you want as an input. Something we probably don't want, but it's just for the sake of showing you this. Uh, we can also define enum types directly in the schema, and the schema validation will guarantee that we receive valid input values. Uh, this is very nice because consumers can know exactly what are the fields that are valid, like the values that are valid in this field. And it's really nice because if you're using like a GraphQL ID, users may even be able to select the input value from a drop down uh, made with this data. Uh, now we have defined a lot of objects, uh, but what can we actually do with them? Well. Uh, a GraphQL request can be either a query or a mutation, and every GraphQL service has a query type, but may or may not have a mutation type. Uh, these types are the same as regular object types, like the ones we saw before, but they are special because they define the entry point of every GraphQL request. Uh, here we can see, for example, a query, uh, and they allow us to fetch data. Uh, because of that, they are executed in parallel because they don't really modify anything. Well, they are not supposed to. Like You can actually do whatever you want, but you really shouldn't. Um, and now we have a mutation, uh, which allows us to modify data. And they run in series, one after the other. So for example, here, uh, we can send a review for a movie. And we have a, like the content of the review we want to send. And we can get something back as a response. So we have freedom to select all of those different things. Um, and here you can actually notice something new uh, that we didn't show before, which is an input type. They look exactly the same as regular object types, uh, but with the keyword input instead of type. And they are useful when we need to pass complex objects as arguments. Uh, passing input objects instead of scalars as arguments is really good, uh, since it's easier to keep it clean when you start adding new parameters, because you can just add a lot of things to the same query, and different people can use it. Uh, so it just helps keep things clean. Uh, and sometimes if you start just working with very simple um, scalars, then you will have to actually start putting things in objects for them to make more sense. Um, so it's a very convenient thing. Now that we are a bit more familiar with the schema, uh, this is how you'd actually make a query and what a response would look like. In this case, we are querying for a movie uh, by providing the ID of the movie, and we are requesting back the ID, title, budget, and release. It's very common in GraphQL that you get back some of the information you sent, but you don't have to request it if you don't want it. Um, 
But for example, uh, we since we can ask for exactly the information we need, uh, maybe we don't need all the information, uh, and we just request the ID and the title. Uh, aside from smaller response payloads, this can also make the request faster, since depending on the way the API is designed, the computation of specific fields may be done only when they are requested, uh, if things are correctly implemented. So maybe you're saving quite a bit of time by not requesting the budget, because maybe that has to be requested from another API that might be slower. So uh, it just gives you a bit more freedom. Uh, and this is how a mutation would look. like. It's pretty simple, as you'd expect. We send the necessary information to submit the new review, and we request the title of the movie we reviewed for the response. Um, but what if something goes wrong when we perform a query or a mutation? Well, uh, GraphQL provides a very specific way of handling errors, uh, which diverges from what we are used to when developing REST APIs. There's an errors field, which is only present in the response if errors occur in, during the request. Um, each error is a map that must contain at least an error message and might contain also the path and location fields uh, to highlight in what part of the request uh, in the GraphQL response and document the error occurred. So for example, here the movie was not found and we know the location in, in the schema where that happened and also the path. Uh, in this case, it's a very simple path, but this can be really useful if you have, like, because it's a graph, imagine that you have a response that is a lot more nested uh, and maybe only like a small part fail, you know exactly what failed here. Um, we can also enrich error responses by adding an extension field where we could, for example, add a code that can be parsed by your consumers upon failure. Uh, so there's really no reason to miss HTTP status codes because there's still something that we can provide that can be parsed by consumers reliably. Uh, another really cool thing of using errors correctly in GraphQL is that you get partial responses. Uh, if, for example, your service has to call another service to get the budget of a movie, as we said before, and that uh, upstream service is unresponsive, uh, we could still provide other information, uh, such as the movie title, as shown here. And we get in the error, like exactly the part that failed, which was just getting the budget. And there's a lot of more interesting features in GraphQL, uh, but we cannot cover all of them here, so I really encourage you to check them out if you think this is interesting. And now that we know a bit about GraphQL, uh, let's see some of the advantages it has over REST and that made us decide to use it for APIs. Since consumers will get only the fields that they request, a single GraphQL query or mutation can do things that might, might have been previously done in different endpoints. Uh, this reduces the number of requests that an API consumer needs to obtain the information that they want. Uh, it can also make consumers' application faster and less vulnerable to errors related to network issues. Um, this ability to select the exact information you need can also translate in smaller, in smaller response payloads, like we said before. We also have the flexibility to add new fields uh, to a response without affecting existing consumers, uh, which promotes continuous growth. Uh, and this growth uh, can also help avoid the explosion of endpoints. Uh, for example, in REST, you create a new application with a few endpoints, but as time goes by, you'll add, uh, you'll want to provide greater functionality, and the way you usually do this is that you start creating new ones. Uh, in GraphQL, this can also be done by just enhancing an existing query, and it doesn't have to get excessively complicated or dirty. I mean, it actually really makes sense. Uh, but everything's clear with an example, so let's see an example of this. So first we have uh, a very simple REST endpoint uh, where we are going to be requesting a movie by providing just the ID. Okay, that's fine. Uh, now we add a second endpoint where we actually provide the ID of the movie, uh, but we want to get back the reviews. And maybe we want to have the option of only getting the reviews that have a certain score. So we filter by the score. I mean, an optional query parameter, so far so good. We have two endpoints. Uh, in GraphQL, this could also be done just by this. Uh, we have a movie query, we provide ID, and we can get back information about the movie, for example, the title and budget, and also the reviews. And we also have the same score field that we had before. I mean, this is one query versus two endpoints, but you don't really see a lot of advantages here, right? Me neither. Uh, but what if we start adding more endpoints? So now we also want to get the actors for a given movie. Uh, so we add a third endpoint to get the actors. Uh, but what if we need all of this information? And imagine that getting the reviews on the actors is expensive. So maybe you have to get them somewhere that is pretty slow. Maybe you have to like pay for the queries that you're making. Maybe it's not something you want to do at, at every moment. 
because maybe it's not necessary. Uh, so maybe you will add like a fourth endpoint that just returns like everything, or maybe you will, you will start doing some weird things with weird parameters. I mean, things just kind of start to get a bit bigger uh, as you want to kind of have more specificity uh, related to what you get and what you don't. Uh, and this is where GraphQL really shines because this is literally all we have to do in GraphQL. We just add another uh, field to our response. And if people want it, they can request it. And if they don't need it, they don't have to, uh, which can really bring a lot of advantages. And we can start adding uh, like filters to, each indiv to these individual uh, fields, which makes them really powerful. So we can still have our scores filter in the actors. Maybe we can filter like only actors that have, I don't know, a certain last name or that they're from a certain continent. You can kind of get really creative and it's still very simple for the user to understand things. You don't have to like read like the whole documentation to understand for endpoints. Uh, finally, as a bonus perk, it's good to mention that GraphQL is self-documented. Uh, the schema is not optional and it's always up to date. So at the very least, consumers can get the information needed for the request through schema introspection. Uh, you can and you should add descriptions to each field in the schema explaining what it does. Um, and this is what GraphQL calls introspection. It just means that you can ask a GraphQL application for the schema that it's using, uh, and it will return it along with any existing descriptions. So documentation is right at the point of consumption. It's easier to find and has a better chance of being kept up to date. And at the end of the day, it's just something that is very easy to read. Uh, so you don't really have to try to understand what are the endpoints that you need to make um, the request. Uh, it's just a lot more like something you would be reading and just easier to understand. Uh, so now I'm going to leave you with Jason, who's going to explain a bit about how you actually implement a GraphQL API. Hey, so thank you, Arena. Uh, great introduction. So we're going to we're going to take a look now at sort of the the next level of detail of an actual implementation of a GraphQL API. Um, if you start looking around on the internet and you just search for like GraphQL server, um, you're very likely going to end up uh, somewhere near Apollo server, uh, which is a project uh, that runs on Node and is written in JavaScript and is extremely common and influential in the GraphQL community, or maybe Express GraphQL. You'll find a lot of things that are centered in, in sort of the JavaScript ecosystem. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, like GraphQL as a spec and as a technology is multilingual. It is not just tied to JavaScript. And in particular, at New Relic, we run the majority of our backend services on the JVM, uh, commonly using either Java or Kotlin are sort of our go-to languages. And so when we came to uh, having our backend teams implement GraphQL APIs, the idea of changing our whole tool set over to Node just wasn't very attractive. Fortunately, there's good support in the JVM ecosystem, and that's what we'll take a look at. This may be a, a less common way of doing GraphQL, but I think it's interesting uh, to, to maybe see some options that uh, you haven't necessarily run into in uh, all the common cases. There is basically one major implementation in the JVM space, this GraphQL Java uh, library. And what it provides is the, the schema and the query execution. It is really an engine for driving, turning a GraphQL query into the response objects uh, that we're wanting to serialize back. So there's a couple of different steps that we're gonna take a look at in this whole process. Um, as was mentioned, GraphQL is commonly served over HTTP. It's sort of an alternative uh, to REST in that sense. Um, there is, interestingly, it is not part of the direct GraphQL standard how you serve it over HTTP. There are some good resources on the, on the main website about it, but they're in sort of the learning section and they have suggestions about how you package up those requests and what's supported. And there's a lot of commonality in this, but it's worth noting that like this isn't part of the core GraphQL spec itself. The core spec is about the query language, the responses and how those are structured. Work is underway to get this spec out, but part of what it means is that you may find some variations in some of the subtler details of how different servers from different languages may actually implement 
uh, the HTTP transport layer of how they talk GraphQL. This was particularly pertinent for us because at New Relic, uh, while a lot of our teams are running on the JVM and we wanted to enable them serving GraphQL APIs uh, from, from the JVM, our public facing GraphQL service, which is sort of the entry point for all of these things, was written in Elixir and pre-existed a lot of the, uh, the various other things that we've been uh, talking about and uh, this approach. So what we wanted was we really wanted to be able to match the semantics of how that was being served from uh, NerdGraph is the name for our, our GraphQL server that we're doing. And so we actually took on to do some of that, uh, that HTTP serving at kind of the next lower level. Now this is not really that difficult uh, for us. We, we use a, a fairly standard uh, Java library called Drop Wizard for doing HTTP serving. In this case, it basically just needs one endpoint, uh, which is typically called GraphQL, that will take the parameters with the request and the variables and the things that you handed it, and then hands it off to that GraphQL object uh, to actually execute and return the object uh, from that. So we had to do a little bit of this binding ourselves, but it was fairly straightforward. And then that also gave us the freedom to match it up so that it aligned with our other GraphQL services internally at New Relic that we wanted to behave like. So that's the HTTP side. We have a server. It knows how to talk to a, this object, but how, how does it know how to turn that schema that we have into something meaningful. What are these, like this schema definition tells us something about what, what's happening, but it doesn't, doesn't give us any of the details of like what data store do we call, what API, what computations do we actually do. So this is where the GraphQL Java library, it has a very rich API and a lot of support for a lot of options, but we found a lot of uh, sort of simple patterns that we follow found ourselves following uh, on multiple teams. And we distilled them into a helper library called New Relic GraphQL Java Core. We're very, very creative with our naming there. Um, that sort of wraps up the common things that we do when telling the GraphQL engine how to interpret the schema uh, and the requests that are coming in and turn it into objects for us. So this is what a basic uh, wire up of a schema would look like. So the GraphQL object that we're retrieving here at the top, this is the thing that comes from the underlying uh, library. This is basically the engine for fulfilling a GraphQL request. We have our own class, this simple GraphQL builder, uh, which you feed uh, the schema. So it takes the, the text essentially of the schema as we've defined it. And then we have little methods on it here that we can use to inform the engine about how to resolve the different things that are in the schema. Uh, in, in a lot of other GraphQL libraries and ecosystems, these are called resolvers. In GraphQL Java, for whatever reason, they're called fetchers. But the basic idea is that when a certain field gets retrieved off of a type, we need to know how to execute the code to do that. And so what we're doing here is we're informing the GraphQL engine that when the query type is asked for the field movie, it will be fulfilled by this query movie type. You can wire those up as many of them as you want. There's nothing special either, as we've mentioned about the query or mutation types. You can do it on other types. So here we can see that the reviews field on the movie type is actually handled separately from the main movie lookup. This means if that's expensive, takes an extra API call. If you don't ask for reviews, we don't have to go execute that lookup. So once we've informed the library of where to call our code, and how to go get the data that it needs. Uh, we need to actually write the thing that binds that together. In Java, Java is a pretty plain, basic, object-oriented sort of programming language, and it really is natural in it to deal with objects like this. So we would have a class for our movie. The movie would take certain parameters on construction. There are getter and setter methods that know how to interact with the fields that we've stored there. It's boring, it's boilerplate, but it's the way that things work uh, in the ecosystem. And GraphQL Java interacts very nicely with these patterns. It works very well with objects that follow those standards. 
So our Fetcher class, that query movie that's actually the guts of how we get the work done, it implements an interface. That interface is data fetcher. And in this case, we're telling it uh, more specifically the type that we're going to return. There is an untyped version that just hands back an object um, if you needed it. So this class is really only going to implement, uh, have to implement one method, and that method is just get. What do I do when you ask to go fetch things? And it gets handed a data fetching environment that has all of the details that we need to be able to figure out what is actually being requested and where to go for that other data. In our specific case here, uh, we had a movie field, and that movie field takes an ID, and the environment has all of the arguments that were passed to that field available for it. So in this case, we retrieve that by calling get argument on the environment, and then we turn it into an integer. Everything's happy, we can get the context that we need. The data fetching environment has a lot of other information in it as well. Like this is like the simplest cases just looking at arguments, but like if you have a nested uh, schema with a bunch of object trees, you will be able to see who the parents are above you in that. There's things to support delayed data loading. There's other contexts where if you have information that you need to track across the course of a query getting resolved, you can put your own information in there that will be available to later fetchers. The environment is really the center of how we do that data fetching. And then once we have that ID, in this case, we're just delegating off to a service that knows how to look up our movie class and return an object of the type movie to us. Now, you'll notice that this doesn't say anything about JSON. This doesn't know about those pieces. That's taken care of transparently when we follow those standard Java object shapes by the GraphQL library itself. We don't have to do anything fancy. Your design for fetchers is something that's actually uh, very, um, you have a lot of options. They're kind of like controllers in an NBC setup where you can decide how much work goes into them and, and uh, how much of that gets extracted into other classes. It's definitely worth thinking deeply about your design for them, though, because uh, as the graph in GraphQL uh, suggests, you know, there can be uh, deeper nesting in things in these schemas than it might have looked like in our example. So with a, with a movie, uh, with this sort of domain, for instance, movies might have actors. From an actor, you would expect that you could look up the other movies um, that, uh, that, uh, that that actor has been in. Or you may look up a genre of the movie and be able to get back other movies. And you can see that there might be this big nested uh, hierarchy of things. That can be factored into your fetchers, but you need to think about how that's going to happen. Um, and you need to, to architect things and, and put them together to make your life easier if you're going to have that sort of reuse of the fetcher uh, code. Extracting pieces into other services and other things that get called out to is a really good idea. Like having your fetchers get really huge and complicated is going to make your life harder. There's no reason that uh, all that logic needs to stay just in that class. You can move it to other places. So last but not least, you may look at this, um, and it's a fairly common complaint that folks have that like, well, this, this schema business, it's like, I feel like I'm repeating myself, right? I have my, uh, my schema definition language here. I write down all of the types for these objects, all the names for these things, and then I have to do it again in my code. Um, that movie class that I, I showed you in Java looks just like this type that we have there. And you're not wrong. Like, there is actually a lot of sort of uh, parallel things that you want to have defined on both sides. There's a lot of different approaches to doing this. At New Relic, uh, what we've chosen to do is kind of a schema first approach where we take the, the GraphQL schema as written here on the left and we use that with some generators to generate the code on the right. This gives us, uh, the big power that this gives to us is that those schema files are useful to people who are maybe not conversant in Java or not conversant in the languages that are the backend implementation is happening in. So it can be used as kind of a means of communication between teams that everybody understands the schema, even if they don't necessarily understand all of the structure of the backend code that's providing it. Um, 
We've open sourced that earlier library that I mentioned. We're looking to open source some of the work that we've done here. There are lots of other alternatives uh, for those who like it in the Java realm. There are annotation based things where you annotate classes and it generates a schema the other direction um, based off of your classes. Um, so there's a lot of richness and variety to, to consider here. But don't feel like uh, you're going to be locked into having to do tedious repetition of things. There are tools that you can find uh, and make to, to help deal with that. So one of the big powers of GraphQL is that it, it kind of gives you a centralized query language to talk about things. And it's very natural that uh, like for an organization, you may want to have a kind of a central point that people talk to your GraphQL schema. Uh, in New Relic, we have that with our public facing API and actually our applications are built off of that same API increasingly. Um, and it's, it's like we have one thing, there's one GraphQL schema. Well, this sounds pretty monolithic um, and that can be a big problem, uh, but there are a lot of different techniques that you can use to avoid that pain and distribute out the pieces of your, your GraphQL architecture. So you can definitely imagine how uh, if you have one sort of gateway that serves as the main entry point, this is the point that looks to the world like it is the entirety of your GraphQL schema, it could certainly be farming part of that work out to other services. And in fact, if those other services speak GraphQL, that gateway uh, has a lot of power to be able to generically sort of talk to the different services that are there. At New Relic, when we started off, uh, the gateway, our NerdGraph service, it was directly integrating in code with REST-based APIs and then turning those into uh, GraphQL-shaped uh, uh, APIs to, to the outside. But increasingly, we've moved towards having uh, GraphQL behind that because it's made things a lot easier for us. There are kind of two biggish approaches that I would, I would say are out there. Uh, for doing this sort of work. One you'll hear talked about is called federation, and then one uh, that is more the approach that we've taken at New Relic is called schema stitching. And neither of these are perfectly standard, neither of these are fully in, in the spec. They are things that are built on top as well. Um, so federation to talk about first, Apollo uh, previously mentioned as sort of one of the, the key GraphQL server technologies. Um, they have a federation spec. So they have a way of saying, uh, if you use these libraries and you use uh, this particular shape to things, you can make a gateway service that will talk out to multiple other GraphQL services and bring those together to make them look like one thing. To do that, uh, because the base GraphQL spec does not actually contain enough information, even in its introspection, to allow that sort of federation, uh, the federation, uh, specification from Apollo needs some extra help. So there are some extra scalar types and uh, types and fields and directives that you have to use in your service um, to be able to uh, interact with it and have it, it play along. You also uh, end up enmeshing this fairly deeply into your schema itself. So here you can see we have these at key directives and those tell uh, the GraphQL federation when it needs to look things up externally, what things are the identifiers that it's supposed to use. It's a very generalized system. It's built to work with any sort of thing that you might want to federate out. Um, but you've got to give it some of those hints. And those things uh, show up in your schema and they show up in, in other parts of your system that you have to run. So, at New Relic, we've taken a little different approach on it. Um, and as I mentioned, part of, part of this is history. Like we had our GraphQL service and it was calling out to many different things internally um, before Apollo Federation was really available. Um, it's also implemented not in JavaScript, so taking advantage of some of those pieces was not, not as easy. But it's interesting to sort of look at, I think, as a, an, an alternative way of thinking about it. And we call it schema stitching. Um, one of the key observations that we had was that as an organization, we really didn't need all of the generic power of have, allowing anyone to tag anything onto any field anywhere in the schema. There were certain key points for our schema that mattered. 
there were points where it made sense that teams would want to hook into. And by having a more limited scope, we were able to deal with the problem a lot more simply internally without having to bring along a lot of the extra uh, pieces that the full generic federation needed. So for us, uh, this is a tool called Graphical. It's commonly available. We've got our own sort of customized version that adds this little query builder on the side. Um, but you can see here in the center one of our sorts of queries. New Relic is an app as a observability and uh, monitoring system. Um, so our, a lot of our things revolve around what we call entities. So those are things that we monitor, your application, your browser application, your host. Um, and so here we have, we're under our actor, we're asking for uh, searching for browser applications. And then below that, uh, kind of at the same level, we're asking for information about the user. So the current user that's making the request. Now it's very simple uh, to, to sort of squint at this and recognize that like, both of these things are probably served by a different microservice behind the scenes. Um, and that's the, the key piece that our schema stitching knows about. We know how to add things into our actor. And by using the introspection techniques uh, that Irena mentioned earlier, um, we're able to essentially take a slice of this query that's been uh, added here and forward it along to another GraphQL service and then stitch it back into the response on the other side. So in this case, this request would come in, our main API gateway would look at it, would recognize that entity search is one of the fields that we need to query out for, construct the right query out of what's there, send that on in parallel, it will strip out and send the user query along to the right thing. And then once both of those have returned, it can make the whole response for us. And the nice part about this is that this is supportable and uh, easy to do with just the introspection that's in the GraphQL spec. Like we haven't needed to make any extra directives. We haven't needed to have uh, particular things that, uh, that get um, baked into the schemas downstream. All of it just works off of reading that schema because we've taken a sort of a simpler, more targeted approach to it. So that's kind of, how we've gone about making sure that we don't end up in one big monolith or end up with one big monolith that integrates to a whole bunch of REST services and has a huge amount of uh, additional um, requirements and, and complexity to it. Um, and we've been pretty happy with it. It's worked, worked well and scaled across uh, dozens and dozens of teams that are now shipping APIs in this uh, to the wild. So I think at this point, I'm gonna hand back uh, to my colleague for her to talk to us about monitoring and then some of our uh, real life lessons that we've learned in running GraphQL. Uh, so monitoring. Uh, we need to talk about monitoring, uh, not because we are who we are, uh, but because it gets a bit more complicated in GraphQL. Uh, when Jason said that GraphQL is typically served for HTTP via single endpoint, you might have already thought that monitoring each query and mutation individually was not a trivial task, and indeed it isn't. Um, if you have a REST API, you can easily differentiate between transactions going to different endpoints, making it easy to track their usage, response time, and other useful metrics. Um, but with GraphQL, uh, this is the only thing you get out of the box uh, because all of your requests are aimed at a single endpoint, so you don't have any idea of what's going on with your queries and mutations. Um, but don't worry, because you don't actually have to stay in the dark. Uh, any application monitoring service you use should give you the tools to fix this. For example, uh, when we started to develop GraphQL, our service monitoring relied on the request endpoints, uh, and we just saw this. Um, so we started enhancing our transactions until we had all the information we needed from each request to detect any possible issues. Um, now I will share some of the things that we did and that we would recommend. And even though our solutions were specific to the tools that we had at our disposal with the really clients, uh, you'll still need similar information no matter what you use for monitoring. So you'll probably end up doing something very similar. Uh, 
Um, first, uh, one thing that we found really useful is that you can usually add a name to your transactions. Uh, so you can see the exact query or mutation chain being executed instead of the default, which would just be the endpoint. Uh, this obviously has kind of the limitation that you can have, like at some point your graph can start to kind of um, span out and you need to kind of uh, set kind of sort of like a coding point uh, until where you track the like what is what you consider the root of the transaction so you can start tracking that uh, but it's still really useful because most of the time you might not go so deep into the graph uh, and you can get uh, a good idea of what's going on uh, here instead of just using the query name uh, we could also use the operation received in the request uh, but keep in mind that the operation is optional and it depends on the client so it's basically the name that they consider for this operation that they're making. So you might not want to rely on that and instead just kind of do yourself the traversing uh, to understand what's the path that was followed for the specific query or mutation being executed. Um, adding custom parameters to your transactions is simple and you should add any fields that you think can be useful. This actually also applies to REST APIs since it's very important to know the request parameters that you're receiving. Uh, but in the case of like GraphQL, you really need to start understanding better what's going on because the request can be a lot bigger. Uh, finally, we would also recommend that you add traces to your data fetchers, uh, which with the Java agent is as simple as adding the trace annotation you see here. Uh, this will cause transactions and distribute traces to get a span for each fetcher call. Um, it's really important when you're dealing with graphs to, under to understand what's actually going on uh, in the different nodes that are being hit in a request. Um, Another important issue with GraphQL uh, is that it's very easy to miss errors because every response is actually a 200. Uh, so you will have to leverage your monitoring solution tools and track the errors yourself. Uh, in our case, what we do is that we notice expected and unexpected errors when they occur in our services so that they get registered with the request transaction. So if somebody is requesting uh, a movie that they are not allowed to, uh, we will track that as an unexpected error and we will also have uh, unexpected error and we may also have unexpected errors uh, like an upstream failing. Uh, you don't actually get that out of the box because there's no status code to understand what's going on with your application. Um, finally, uh, migrating to GraphQL was necessary for my team since it's a communication standard and new relic and our services won a lot from it. We have much richer APIs where consumers can get exactly the information they need we provide better information about errors in our services and our dependencies. And I think it's made us think a lot harder about our design choices. Uh, so we now want to finish this talk by leaving you with some of our key learnings so that you can go and try it yourself. First, I have to say that GraphQL is great. It comes with all the features and advantages that we've discussed, but it's not a perfect match for every use case. Um, if you have a small service with a single upstream, you may not be able to get enough value out of it to justify the additional complexity and the verbosity that GraphQL comes with. Um, or if you have a service that needs to be super optimized, you may not be able to afford the additional object creation and the garbage, and the garbage collection. And uh, you may need something more minimal in that case. As with everything, there are trade-offs and you really need to evaluate both the good and the bad in relation to your needs. Uh, but overall, it's been a win for us because of the reasons that we already explained before. Uh, as we also saw before, monitoring GraphQL is not simple and out of the box, but it's also not excessively complicated when you're, once you understand the information that you need to have. Uh, so you really need to be able to see the performance of your queries, their usage, if there's any part of a request graph that's failing. Uh, so don't stay in the dark and make the effort to kind of have really good monitoring for your service and don't make your life harder than it needs to be. Uh, it's also important to think carefully about your schema and to start out being, being pretty conservative about what you're putting it. Uh, it's easy to add new parameters and fields, but renaming or removing things is still a breaking change. And it's easier to paint yourself into a corner due to how rich a GraphQL schema is. Uh, since GraphQL is strongly typed, it's easy to make small mistakes. Like you might start defining something as a string and then realize that it should actually be an ID or a number. Um, it's also easy to run into issues with graph traversing since you might not expect that a specific fetcher can be called from a given query, but it's possible to get there from some other node. Uh, this kind of runs into what Jason explained before, that you really need to think carefully the way that you design your application in GraphQL. Um, I mean, in the end, you're going to make mistakes when you make like your first uh, queries, and you just are going to have to deprecate those and create new ones. That's kind of the way things evolve in GraphQL. 
and it's also perfectly normal. Uh, finally, a uh, common complaint you hear is that almost every GraphQL response is a 200. Uh, so you, as we mentioned before, you lose the convenience of HTTP codes and simple error responses. Uh, but your API can actually gain a lot if you implement error handling correctly. Uh, your consumers could know exactly what part of the request failed, and if one of your APIs upstreams is down, they could also receive a partial response from all your information that you can still provide. Uh, so now we'll share three approaches to GraphQL error handling that we've actually seen before. Um, at first, some may be tempted to disregard the specification and just keep returning standard HTTP errors. This works, we've been doing it for a long time, uh, but it's not what your consumers expect, and it doesn't really allow you to leverage many of the GraphQL features. Um, so it's a bit of like, why are you adopting GraphQL at all if you're not going to kind of get the good parts of it that you're already paying for? Um, then another approach that we've seen is to return like status codes as part of your response. This is better and it could allow you to return partial responses, uh, but it's still not standard. And it forces your consumers to always request the status field. Uh, and you don't really get any information about the point where the, where the request failed. Because if you're returning this, you're not going to be returning the errors because you're actually returning like the response. Um, the advantage that this could have is that you can actually have the errors that your users uh, are going to receive as part of your schema, so it's easier to read. Uh, so it's something that is kind of really easy to want to adopt this way. Um, but you still miss out uh, on if you don't use the standard approach, which is actually this. Uh, this is a spec compliant error response. It contains a helpful error message, the path of the request that caused the error, an error code, so your consumers don't have to do any awkward string parsing, and it leaves the door open to returning partial responses whenever possible, um, which is pretty powerful. And that's it. <laughs> Thanks a lot for joining us, and I hope that we managed to spike your curiosity regarding GraphQL and that you enjoyed the rest of the event. I think we will now be answering questions. So we'll stop sharing. So I don't know if we were supposed to have moderator taking the questions uh, for us or not, but uh, looking over in the chat um, earlier, uh, Miguel Quintero had asked, uh, how do you handle schema and graph changes? Is there something like URL versioning? Um, and I, I think you kind of, uh, you alluded to some of that, Karina, but how, how, do we, how do we handle changes? What's the, the process like? Um, so what we do is that when we get to a point where a query cannot keep on evolving and we're really into add something different that's a can change, we uh, start by deprecating it. Uh, so there's actually, I think it's part of the specification, there are deprecation steps that you need to follow. So first you need to kind of put like a notification of the deprecation saying like are the reason for this and what's the query that should be used instead. And then the next step is that you start returning errors as part of your response. And then eventually at some point you do start, like you don't return anymore the correct um, output of that query. And then eventually you are able to remove it. So it's a bit of a slow process. Uh, the whole time that it's going to take will depend on sort of your uh, organization's uh, standards for deprecating things. Uh, but that's more or less what you would have to do to be able to deprecate something. It also depends on the usage. If you're tracking the usage and there's literally nobody using that, then that's something you can probably speed up a bit. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think part of what I've seen too with teams is that uh, like GraphQL makes it easy to grow by addition. And because there's no wild cards in the query, you can't surprise somebody. They have to ask for a new field for anything new to show up in the query. And so very often we'll end up uh, supporting multiple ways of asking for similar information that we've evolved over time. We have new additions. We just keep the old things and map back to them and keep it working um, within the same schema uh, if, it's, if it's not worth or for that period of time that we have to mark things deprecated. So it's, it's pretty powerful that way. I think mm -hmm. the next question is from Lucas. Uh, isn't the multi endpoint problem kind of moot with HTTP2? Um, I think partly uh, because you do kind of solve the issue from like having several, like 
having several requests to the endpoints and just getting statistics from network issues from them. Uh, but I think you still kind of have to like, you still have to know the endpoints that you're going to be requesting. And I think it's still going to be depending on where you're using them. So I'm not sure. What's your take on it, Jason? Yeah, I, I think you're right that like HTTP2 deals with some of like the network level stuff if you just had parallel requests that you needed to make. Um, where GraphQL shines a bit more is when there's dependent data. So like if I needed to make REST call one and then take something out of that and use that to decide, you know, it gives me the ID for the thing that I need to make the next query to. HTTP2 helps, but you're, that can't be fully parallel, right? You still have to wait to get uh, the things back. And so you, you can, I think, use GraphQL to, to craft queries where you can really just ask for all of what you need and it fulfills it all on the server side in, in sort of one request. Um, Maxine pointed out the GraphQL Java Tools library. Um, that is a that is a really good uh, good call out. I know some teams at New Relic had had some trouble with it. That I am honestly not clear on what it was, so I haven't tried it out in detail. Uh, but the GraphQL Java Kickstart org kind of has a number of add-ons and additional things that are not they're not considered part of the core library, but uh, are there to, to leverage. So that might be something that would be uh, worth looking into if you're looking to do this in the Java space. Um, it's definitely one of the, the front runners for um, places to find things. It's sort of uh, the parallel project to the, the core library there. Next up from Elias. Uh, maybe if you can explain the right approach uh, to structure your project. Like, well, yeah, I mean, like from my vantage point and, and what we've had a lot of success doing, it, it doesn't end up being shaped in a lot of ways super differently from a typical REST service in the languages and the ecosystem that we're in. Uh, we just end up with less HTTP endpoints. So we still have domain models that are all the objects. Rather than controllers, you have fetchers. We still have services that call to our databases, repositories for doing all of that access. Um, it's just shaped a little differently um, in terms of how, how we craft that final level of the response and where that is. Um, so it, it has been nice to like, I don't feel like we've had to abandon all of our practices. It's just a little bit different response format um, at the at the front layer of things, and then all the same sort of software engineering that we do behind that, uh, just like we were doing before. How's your experience been with that, Arena? Has it been difficult yeah. on GraphQL projects, or do they seem kind of the same? Or like, what's your what's your vibe? I think the biggest difference has been um, with the fetchers. Maybe we have kind of like the tendency of having one seat at first, one single fetcher do too many things. And then we're right to the issue that, I mean, we could actually get here from a lot of different places. Uh, so we probably, we, we did have to kind of restructure things a bit uh, until we got used to kind of keeping things more modular. So if you don't, if you're really not careful on how you're doing things, it can come and bite you afterwards. Um, but I think it's just like the initial period of getting kind of accustomed to it. Also, if you already have like a good design of what you want to do, uh, it's a lot easier. Like when we finally got like a really good schema that we feel comfortable with, everything just kind of was super easy to design because you already kind of have like this blueprint, which is pretty strict, so you don't really have a lot of freedom there. Uh, it was actually very nice. But yeah, at first we did kind of run a bit into that issue with a few of our, our size features. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the schema and query design, which I think the fetcher thing comes right out of that. Like, it's a richer sort of query language than you're used to with a standard sort of RESTful model. So there's definitely uh, some pitfalls you can you can walk yourself into if you're not careful. So. Mm -hmm. Next up from Paris, we have a few questions. Um, so the first one, uh, can you recommend metrics to start with to measure 
Uh, well, the first thing that we started with were the errors <laughs> because we're actually super blind and it's kind of really important to know what's going on. Uh, so the first thing I would say is really start tracking errors. Whenever you generate them, like at the point where you would be like returning a 401, like track that like as an expected error, in this case, like a user error. Uh, also, if you start getting like any upstream errors, you also need to track that. Uh, then you're also going to run into the issue that you don't know the request that you're getting, even if you have the errors. Uh, so setting up like parameters that allow you to know what was the actual request uh, you received. Anything like tracking the input uh, fields that you receive. Uh, tracking at least up to some point, like we mentioned, the initial tone of the of the query. That's also very good. And at some point, we just kind of add to like the overall transaction the whole query that we got. So if we start seeing something really weird, and uh, you can always go there and see like, oh, okay, is this query is something that nobody else did before, and we didn't account for this. Um, so you can start adding things as you run into issues where you feel like you're blind. But I feel like that was sort of our process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think that covers a lot of the the big bits to me. Like there, there's a lot more coming in with the request between the the query and you can pass variables and parameters in different ways and name the operate. Like there's a lot of different things that it, it GraphQL standardly gives you on that that front end that you want to like make sure you get all of that because <laughs> it's not all baked in the URL the way that it was uh, back with a, a RESTful thing. It's, I mean, it's sort of like if you had a RESTful endpoint where somebody needed to post you a body and you do actions based on what's in that body. Like if you're not monitoring and, and capturing what's actually in those parameters, it can be hard to reconstruct uh, why something might be misbehaving. And then from there, like, we call the databases, we call the other services, you know, we do the same sort of work in the processing on, on the back end that uh, you do anywhere else. So just making sure that that has the standard sorts of monitoring to capture your time spent, capture which calls are getting made, you know, know what APIs your stuff is actually hitting uh, given a, give a certain query, like all, all of that still applies uh, just same as it ever did. Uh, I'm going to the second question. I think maybe that uh, counts as a checklist. Um, I mean, or you mean like a checklist for the whole material? I think this is actually going to be recorded. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I yeah. think so. It might be good for us to get a write up posted somewhere, though. That would be nice, actually. I guess yeah. um, going into, can you recommend uh, which OWASP security? items are the top three we should keep top of mind. Um, I would say we we have actually kind of respected the usual things with it. Uh, we, like, you don't accept any user input without validating. Uh, you only use uh, a standard uh, deserializer and serializer. Do we have to actually add anything else from security that we didn't have before, Jason? Yeah, I don't think so. I mean, I think uh, if anything, GraphQL gives us a, a more standard surface area for some of those things. It's like, well, a request has to look exactly like this, and all of them will look exactly like this. Um, but yeah, can't think of anything else that's come out of the security security team particularly. Yeah. I mean, it's like a in, at the end of the day, it's just like a normal post request. If you want to look at it a bit like that, so kind of same things of like yeah um also has anyone in the community provided about resources or best practices related to errors and handling them um well we do have a lot of internal documentation related to error handling so we go a lot by that but i think there's the actual like the graphql spec also provides good information related to it i mean it's a sort of group. And actually, I, I would I would plus one that and and give even the additional thing that like for a spec, the GraphQL spec is actually very readable and has a lot of really useful information and thoughts about design and how things should go together. So like, it's it's definitely worth digging into that um, if you're interested in getting into this. Um, 
So I know we've got more questions, but I know we're also, I think, running down towards time. I'm not sure exactly when we're supposed to be done. I think we have three minutes left. We have three minutes left. How quickly do folks have to get to their next session? So. Probably 40 seconds. <laughs> Um, so maybe, I think we have time maybe for a few more questions. Yeah, probably a few more. Um, so I think uh, just, sorry, jumping a little ahead to give one that I think that there's a, a simpler answer to. Uh, somebody, uh, Anasama? Some, uh, asked about generating uh, unit tests, scaffolding. Um, and I haven't done that and I haven't seen it, but it very easily could be done. That's one of the awesome things about GraphQL sort of introspective API. It's like you can ask it exactly what's there and exactly what queries are valid and not. Um, so that would be a really interesting idea of uh, using that to sort of uh, pave out some of your, your testing uh, shape. So. It's a good thought. I don't have a lot of experience with open API or O data. I don't think that either of those are things that, that we've used. So I don't know that I can speak compellingly uh, to those in, in general. Uh, there's mentioned in one of the questions about circuit breakers and how those are dealt with. Like we do circuit breaking in the fetchers and the service levels, just like we would with, uh, with any other sort of thing. Um, with GraphQL, that ends up resulting in partial data. You know, if a field hits an error, whether it's because it's a full error or because it circuit broke, because the downstream service is known to be having problems, um, e either way, it just sort of short shortcuts there. Um, but yeah, sorry, I don't know enough about those others to like compellingly compare uh, the the deeper technology on them. Mm -hmm. Going on to maybe recommended courses, um, when I was learning GraphQL, I actually, like, the spec is really good because they actually provide a lot of examples. So honestly, I, like, read the spec and I was going off of there and then I tried to do, like, some uh, dumb things on my own. And it's just very friendly. Um, I think the community that has the most support is JavaScript. So maybe you just want to kind of start understanding GraphQL. It's just very simple to maybe just I think there's a Express GraphQL thing that you can download, and it's just super easy like, to start getting with that. And just to kind of understand the logic of GraphQL, because that really um, translates very well to our languages. So mm -hmm. maybe that's an option. Um, it's sort of the way I did it, and then just practicing with things. Um, and maybe where we would recommend REST over GraphQL. Um, we touched a bit on it, uh, but if you have like a very, very simple service, uh, maybe GraphQL is really not going to be worth it uh, because it shines a lot better when you actually have a lot of dependencies uh, and when you can actually, for example, provide uh, partial responses, that's where you really start to get like a lot. From it. Uh, but if it's just a very simple service, you might not really gain a lot from that. And also one thing that we run into is if you have a service that's just about uploading a lot of data, uh, like we're gonna have to have like a REST endpoint for that. So yeah. I think maybe those are some cases. Yeah, those are those are the big ones to me. It's like Graph, GraphQL is kind of optimized for being able to grow that schema over time, have dynamic queries that you can do. The graph is right there in the name. It it, it wants a graph traversal of objects that you're in. Sometimes you're you're just not trying to build something like that, and it just doesn't need those avenues to grow. Um, and there's nothing wrong with with a REST API uh, to do something straightforward. Uh, Divya asked about uh, deploying distributed GraphQL and cloud solutions. Um, we kind of, uh, at New Relic, we've got our own sort of internal cloud and then some pieces running on AWS. We haven't used any uh, solutions that are really tied to any particular provider, uh, though. So I, I know that there are things out there to give some better support uh, for those, but um, 
but yeah, I, I don't know uh, any any more details to be able to point to at particular implementations for it. I think we had maybe one more and then we should probably close up. Um, yeah, uh, GraphQL is for querying for writes. Do we stay with REST? Um, so this is where there's uh, two top level types. Actually, there's a third one that we didn't really touch on, uh, query and mutation. And so the, the standard with GraphQL is that mutation is intended to have calls that write data. The shape of how everything else uh, works, all of the field selection, how you pass arguments, all of it's shaped the same between the query and mutation side, but that's uh, the conventions that if you're, if you're site affecting, it should be a mutation. If it's pure reading, it should be off of the query. Yeah, uh, what I meant before was that if you're uploading data, for example, like you're uploading pictures, uh, because every GraphQL request is already a post, like you cannot really update data there. Uh, but if you're like modifying things, for example, the, in the examples of it, maybe you want to send a view for a movie, um, that's perfectly fine with GraphQL. Um, mutations work with no problem. Yeah. Uh, I think we are going to have to close here because we're already for time, right? Cool. Well, thank you all for your time, and uh, hopefully this has uh, been interesting and whet your appetite to find out more. So, yeah. and thank you for the discussion. See you. Thank you. Catch y'all.